Hello everyone, I am Corey Andrew Powell and I am joined today by Milan Cordestani. He's the CEO of Auto, and that's A-U-D-O. He's a three-time business founder and brand builder and writer. Now as a social architect, he's built companies that provide active solutions for a future of learning, the future of earning, promoting civil discourse, and supporting independent artists, which I love as I'm also a singer-songwriter, as you all know, and a member of the Grammy voting organization, a shameless plug there, Milan, for myself. But um, I love it. <laughs> welcome to Motivational Mondays. It's great to have you here. Thank you for having me, Corey. I'm excited to get into all of it and uh, to shamelessly plug a lot of what I work on too. So, <laughs> of course, of course, I had exactly. I figured I'd start the shameless plug, and then for the rest Love of the it. show, it's all you. Okay, um, <laughs> but uh, now just to start with, you are 23 at this point. I am 23. Yes, 23. Now that does make you part of what we call the Gen Z generation. And um, I was just telling you before we began that I do sort of feel like it's so reductive just to sort of like classify a generation by a, a letter, uh, but that's what we do now. Um, I happen to be part of Generation X, not that anyone asked, but uh, <laughs> it's a little, yeah. quite a few years difference between uh, our two generations. So I'm fascinated by how much you did at such a young age. So I want to begin with that. The story of your entrepreneurship begins, uh, I think you're about 13 or so, and it begins with a story about your parents bought you a turtle and you somehow turned that into uh, like a five figure turtle trading business or something like that. So please Basically. share that story with us. So, I mean, you know, the story, um, it starts with me being 13, but I'll say this, like Gen Z is a very entrepreneurial generation and I'm now like, I'm considered old, I guess, among that generational bracket. And, um, you know, the turtle thing was like, it, it was a passion project that turned into a business um, because I got that pet turtle originally just because I wanted a turtle, right? I was really excited. I wanted a pet, something that was mine. And my parents wanted something that wouldn't be, you know, a burden on them. And they thought, and, you know, I was obsessed with ecosystems and, and, and agriculture. And I, I really wanted to, you know, for as much as you could be as a 13 year old, I was like, reptiles are cool. Um, and so I got a turtle, they got me a turtle from Petco and I spent hours and hours on YouTube, just learning, how do I take care of it? How do I keep the water clean? And like many others, you eventually end up in these weird rabbit holes on YouTube and like these, um, just tons of weird content. But for me, that ended up being, uh, you know, albino turtles were coming up and I was learning about these aquarium enthusiasts and how they were trying to get the rarest fish or turtles in their aquariums to make their YouTube channels grow. And that was the moment of like, whoa, I could do that. I could probably be the middleman and breed turtles and sell like albino and mohawk shells and, you know, all of these different um, red -eared, albino red eared sliders. So I started doing that for, for a few years until I went to high school and, you know, I became the weird turtle kid. And at some point I was like, ah, next, I got to move on to the next journey. <laughs> but, but you um, were making yeah. five, I mean, I know I saw five figures in your, like in the bio, you were really making like five figures at that point from this, this venture. Yes. So it's pretty absurd when you start to uh, get into it. So if you're actually curious and for any of your audience members to see the pricing of some of these really rare turtles, head to turtlesource.com. I not affiliated with them at all. But you'll see um, it's a very legitimate above board business where they are breeding and selling like, you know, albino turtles that will range from $2,000 at like a hatchling age all the way to, you know, 20 if it could breed. And so there were some that I would keep for older and, and breeding and, you know, um, just just trying to breed different turtles and, you know, incubate them in unique ways to get really I never had like a two header, but you know, people would have two headed turtles and whatever. Right. Like, I've seen them on TV. Like the pretty crazy. Um, yeah. I guess that must be like a whole lot of money if you get a turtle with two heads. I guess um, so. I mean, you know, the challenge, <laughs> the challenge is that those, you know, they, um, I, I, they kind of are scary. Like sometimes so I'm I don't just really saying. want a two headed animal in my, in my, you know, aquarium. It's a little in my weird. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, yes. I've seen them on TV. I'm like, I don't think I want one of those. But um, definitely, it's a great novelty to have. But that's really impressive. It reminds me um, very often of when I watch Shark Tank, for example, which is like one of my big obsessions. And every time I watch Shark Tank, I'm like, okay, I got to like reinvent like the fork and add like a fifth spike on it or something, you know, <laughs> or just <laughs> try to figure out something. But I think what's so fascinating is that at a young age, you actually went from the uh, the idea of concept to actual 
uh, execution, which I think is where um, like many of us don't get to when it comes to entrepreneurship and then starting a business. So you do that right. from like 13 to 16, and then you now move into this whole other area, which is more tech-based, right. um, artificial intelligence, digital format content. I do uh, wonder though, is it content that you're creating for the Gen Z generation or is it for the masses with your current yeah. venture? Auto right now that we're building this company, uh, we're building it specifically for Gen Z. And eventually we'd like to say that it'll scale to a point where anyone could come in and say, you know, I've been, um, I've been in the, my career for five years. I'm looking for a change. I want to move into a completely new industry and being able to use AI to help um, recommend the, the right courses that they would need to match with the best opportunities that you know they're looking for. So it's really the bridging. We're using AI to bridge that the learning that is necessary to find those new earning or job opportunities. And while the focus is Gen Z, that entry level, that um, you know, fourteen to twenty-one year old, it definitely eventually can get you know much uh, much more broad. Yeah. Well, so let's stay on auto for a minute. And of course, I did earlier mention it's spelled A-U-D-O, so people don't think we're talking about cars. Um, it's a, defined as a career building and management destination, but explain a little bit about how it works. How is it different from any other sort of like job searching tool out there? And why would people use auto versus another site? Or would they use it in conjunction with other sites? How would it work? Yeah. So we're trying to eliminate the need actually to have to go to all of these different sites, find these different, um, you know, solutions and have your data siloed and instead have your data work for you. So when you think of like your consumption on Netflix or any other, you know, streaming economy, you're getting upfed content that makes you want to stay there. We want to do the same thing to make you earn more money. So essentially we've partnered with Coursera, edX, Alice and Learn, um, but we're going after all of these course partners because not because we want to reinvent the course material themselves, um, but we want to create adaptive learning, adaptive curriculum, where based on your goals, whether they're financial goals, career goals, dreams, we are able to help find the balance in what you need to upskill and become relevant in today's job market in consideration of those goals. So you come in, we assess you on your personality, on any past experience you have to find out if there's any soft skills or hard skills that can translate to um, the career paths that we're going to recommend for you to pick from. And then, of course, we assess you on any skills to make sure we're not we're not making you take redundant information because it's, you know, this generation is amazing. Like at 16, 15, uh, you know, people are starting side hustles and businesses and they're gaining education through YouTube and otherwise. So you know, the standard route or the traditional college route isn't for everyone anymore. Yeah. I love that you said that because I do have other, often I've had um, HR experts on or recruiters, headhunters, and people who just work in the field of employment and seeking employment uh, services. Um, we've had that conversation. Whereas, you know, if you decide you do not think college is for you right away, um, it's no longer like this weird kiss of death that it might have been a couple of decades back. I mean, it was really difficult for me. I went to college later in life. I went at 36 and I, I, I like put it off as long as I could working. And then I just couldn't get to that next place because I needed. But the good thing was I had done so much work. To your point, I was able to then apply so much of what I had been doing and I was able to get actual college credits for it when I did go back. So I think it's really, you know, I, these different paths, everyone's not going to be linear. Exactly. It's got to be adaptive. And the, this, you know, traditionally the system hasn't been very adaptive in the way that tech has moved. So it's, it's, uh, that, as a company, we're trying to navigate that, right? The balance of leveraging tech to make this industry that's been around forever, this future of work more palatable and, and um, personal for people. So yeah. I, I love that. So when you went back to school, I'm curious, you got college credit yeah. for it. That's pretty interesting. Can and I tell you, almost a whole semester. Wow. I got four. And, um, yeah. I love that you worked before that because there's one, this generation really wants to work is kind of amazing. Like people want to come and create value and figure out what they want to do by doing rather mm -hmm. than committing to, you know, years of, of 
of learning further and higher learning before even getting to see if that's what they're interested in. Because a lot of people end up going and studying information that they never end up leveraging. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, it's so funny. I just literally about an hour, like an hour and a half ago, had that conversation with a friend and she has an 18 year old daughter who's this amazing entrepreneur who I'm probably going to have on the show because she literally just decided right after high school, no, I'm not going. I'm going to take one year because I have an idea and I can't do it if I'm committed. So college will be there. I'm just 18. And she launched this uh, online hustle, (laughs) this side business that's amazing. It's tied to fashion. It's tied to the economy. It's tied to the, it's tied to ecology, all the things she loves because she gave herself a moment before she went into college to maybe go to be a doctor or lawyer or a thing that someone else had decided for her without her knowing what she wanted to do with her life. So it's a big deal. Now, not to say that college is not, you know, I don't want to say we're bad mouthing college, but. No. (laughs) And, you know, I, I want to also harp on like entrepreneurship isn't for everyone. That ability to like figure it out and just, you know, fail a lot before you kind of figure it out on your own. Um, There is a certain person that loves that. And I I definitely love that. Figuring it out. I don't necessarily always love being told what uh, to learn Mm -hmm. rather than just learning from doing. But that's part of what we're embracing actually with what we're building here, right? Is saying that it doesn't have to be this, let me, this guesswork, you know, it, it can really be more clear of, Let's take one or two courses that are going to give you skills to then get you employed with small gigs, opportunities available online. It could be Etsy. It could be from Upwork um, to eventually then get a longer term job. But you know, we, we don't want people to commit to you know, their whole future at 18 years old. So yeah, I think yeah. That's, that's part of this as well. Yeah, it's a really good um, observation and um, just a good piece of advice because I think um, – you know, you, I've seen, I'll say, um, friends who I know were burned out by 26 because they took a career path just based on what, you know, they were told to do and they don't really like it. And by then they've spent so much time in that job. So yeah, I think that's a great bit of advice. And I appreciate that you are of a young generation that can preach that. I sort of sound like, you know, someone's old uncle going, you better, you know, but to hear you of the, of this generation actually suggesting that is, I think, a lot more more powerful. Now, on your other businesses, now, since we're talking about the um, the branches of business that you have, you have Nota as well. So share um, how Nota is impacting uh, civil discourse. What's that all about? I'll go a little bit along the journey, if that's okay. So like the turtles, for example, right? When I pivoted from that, I was the weird turtle kid in high school. I started writing about the experiences I had, what I was learning, whether it was agriculture, reptiles, or, or being a young entrepreneur. And that was kind of how I got my first opportunity and, or, you know, job, uh, which at the time was writing for the Huffington Post about the agriculture industry from a young person's perspective. And, uh, and that was like a cold pitch that I just, I found her email on Twitter and emailed her and was like, Hey, I, I love this industry. I'm really young. You need this perspective. But, um, that really is how I got into publishing, which got me to eventually build Nota. So after several years, I went to college, I studied um, environmental science there, which really never ended up uh, applying to anything that I do now, uh, beyond just this like mindset of ecosystems and sustainability and businesses. But, you know, I went to school and while I was there, I stopped writing because I felt like so much of what was out there in the world was just like it, it wasn't novel. There weren't stories that were going to create the discourse that I believed we needed to have a society. The hard conversations and the perspectives that we don't hear from enough were just not being elevated. It was the same material and headlines over and over again. So I created a publication called The Doe, and we were an anonymous publisher. So what that meant was people would come to us and say, I've got this crazy story from my life. And, you know, I don't necessarily want my cousin or my sister or whoever to know that this is from my life, but I know that someone's going to benefit from this in a way, one way or another, and I don't want to put my name on it. So I want to share that story. There was a lot of mental health stories from college students. Um, You know, there was a lot of um, transitioning stories from like the LGBTQ community and such, but, um, and politicians as well, talking about being struggling to get things through. But really, as we did that and built that, we used a lot of tech to create a publication and to be able to make people trust a publication in an era where so much faith has been lost in the media industry and 
everyone through social media, right? Is like this commentator um, or like an influencer. So we decided that the best way to scale perspective is to help the publishers work better with journalists. So, it, and it's, it's multi-sided. So Noda basically is working on helping these publishers um, move into the web three, the new web, we like to call it from what was newspapers, they moved to print, or sorry, they moved to websites and such, but they didn't really get to move into this streaming economy or into this, um, you know, app based economy where there is aggregators and there's, um, you know, just a much better way to engage with like really difficult topics. So what we're doing at Noda is we're using AI to help convert um, text content into video format. So Gen Z can, is, you know, who prefers to watch that content instead of just reading articles has a better experience. Um, we're building better connections between how journalists pitch publishers so that more perspective can actually get to these publishers and they get more content efficiently. Right now they just use email. So yeah, there's like a, a few pieces there, but really, you know, I built Noda and uh, it, or at least up from, uh, you know, being this digital publication focused on anonymity. And I brought in um, a new CEO, Josh Brando, to take over and operate that while I focus on auto. Um, and so that's kind of, that's the journey. So, and wow. That, that's, I, I share all that just, sorry, to put a count no, on it. No, no, I'm that, so happy you did. I'm happy you did. That's exactly I, what Just I to show to like, that's, that's the career path, right? Like everyone's is so nuanced. Like how do you, from turtles to writing to tech and, mm -hmm. you know, now I'm in education and technology, but like it's, it's the career paths of people are nuanced. So, yeah, yeah. you know, it's, it's, that's pretty it's gotta awesome. be, yeah. Well, you know, the thing too about it is as we are a leadership podcast and we are talking to college aged uh, um, people in our community, there are also uh, what we call non-traditional people who were like me, who are maybe over 30 or 40, even in some cases, or even 50 and 60 mm -hmm. going to college. Um, so we like universal messaging, right? That doesn't really pertain to any generation. And what you just said, what you just shared, well, actually what you've been sharing from the turtle days um is really that thing that we always want to make sure people people don't lose sight of which is again everyone's path may be different but i think what's important is that you step outside the box that you're fearless that you don't um limit your own abilities based on maybe what other people are projecting on you with their fears there's so many lessons there of you just trusting your instincts and also having support i mean you were young Clearly, your parents were like, he wants to sell turtles. Leave him alone. Let him sell turtles. Yes. I mean, what can, what, what can go wrong? He's selling turtles. I'm assuming uh, yeah. that's what happened. It's, you're, you know, I think it was like the first year they had no idea I was selling turtles. They just like <laughs> knew I had a turtle. And every now and then, like, I would get another one and they didn't really know how right. I was paying for them. But uh, after a while, I, you know, it had to be a conversation of, yeah, so I'm like 14 and I'm right. selling turtles across the country. And, for thousands uh, of dollars. <laughs> yeah, don't, but right. don't, and I use PayPal to do it all. And this new comp PayPal, it just like was pretty new still. And it was like, ah, don't, don't, don't worry yeah, about yeah. it. Um, That's but so funny. To an extent with, with auto, like we're trying to bring more transparency to that process, right? Where a parent would look at the kid and say, you're wasting your time all day long watching YouTube videos. Mm. Like, what are you doing? Instead yeah. saying like, okay, my child is actually like spending time streaming content that is relevant to, you know, their personality and where they're trying to go in a possible career path someday. Yeah. Um, so it's bringing that data and those insights to parents has also been something we're working on. Yeah. That's a big negative stigma that a lot of older parents have with the, with the internet. They don't, um, like I can't get my mother to do her banking. Like she's just convinced that like the minute she puts her bank account number in, like everything's going to be wiped out. Like I've been having this oh fight gosh. with her for like, you know, almost a decade, but I just can't convince her to do it. So, you know, there's that. And then you have the other parents to your point, they just don't really know how it understands. And I think that sometimes adds that, that strange rub between uh, Gen Z millennials and what I call the gatekeepers who are, you know, the older generations who are used to a very different construct. And that brings me to another question for you, which is there's so many negative, uh, well, I guess, as I mentioned earlier, every generation has their appointments, I guess, of negative stereotypes. Um, right. What are, you mentioned one earlier about um, your generation and, and the, the, a misconception, but what are some other things that, you know, for you come to mind as negatives that you've heard people say? 
about Gen Z that you push back on and go, no, 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 no. I think there is this mindset that like Gen Z wants to burn it all down instead of Gen Z wanting to build it up for the new world that exists. Um, and so like there's, you know, there was between crypto becoming a huge movement recently and NFTs and, um, you know, now like online education and enrollment rates in colleges dropping and, and such. There's this big fear that all of these established processes and systems that have existed for so long are being put into question by a generation that might not know enough to be questioning it all. But I think that's now is the time to be doing that um, and to be leveraging the opportunities that we see in tech. So I think that misconception is is um, the misconception that Gen Z is like doesn't know what they're doing, isn't uh, you know isn't going to be successful because we're not following the same traditional path is actually going to make us a much more successful generation because we recognize that the world that exists today is very different than the world that existed, you know, when our parents were, were growing up or um, in my case, my parents who were immigrants coming to the U S like they were obsessed, like go be a doctor, go be a lawyer, become a banker. Like these are the, the you know, the very few options that you have to go to that we know will work. And instead being like, well, no, I'm going to go into tech and be an entrepreneur and kind of become a founder and figure it out. But that's, um, you know, that's, that's, that's one. I, I would add to that only that I think this generation is really passionate about what they want to do with their time and their lives. And so it's really about optimizing. What do you spend your lifetime doing? And it's not just about the dollar amount, but the quality of life, the, the output you have for the world. So I think it's, I think it's beautiful. <laughs> yeah. No, you know, I was, cause I have a whole list of because I've had this conversation before and I've, I, so I had a whole list of things I know people have said about the Gen Z generation and maybe even one or two that I've said myself, not completely, um, not like negative, but there were observations. And I think some of them, there may be some validity to the one uh, thing that I have, I had noticed because I do interact with people who I have to maybe sometimes hire for freelance work and they can range in different uh, age groups and demographics. But I do think a generation that is so tied to technology may definitely have a difficult, more difficult time in the communication directly in person. And maybe not even difficult is the word, but it just may not be as second nature as a technology uh, or, or technology or device. In some cases, that might be an observation that I've seen, but I, and I think that's not a negative. I think it's just sort of to be expected from a generation that literally at this point, I mean, I have a little cousin who's literally asking me for like STEM stuff for Christmas. She's like, you know, four. Wow. She wants to start building cell phones already. You know? And so that's amazing. <laughs> it makes sense, right? That that would be the case. What do you think about that? It's, it reminds me of a conversation I've had a lot, which is in like the scenario people like, I, I love having these conversations of hypotheticals of, what happens if the company is successful? What happens to other remaining industries? And, um, you know, it's like the conversation of college and what, what value does that institution or like universities in the country bring if people can gain the skills that they need to find employment quickly and affordably online? And to me, it actually is that. It's the social component. It's the community. And so Really, I think it needs to be much more affordable. Um, they're making their money from sports anyways. They shouldn't charge so much <laughs> right. for, for the curriculum. Yeah. But but I do think that it's it's going to be that in-person community um, experience, really, like where you get to come in, you get to network, you get to meet people, because those are really hard skills to teach digitally. And while we are seeing a very digital workforce come about, um, there is definitely a big return to in-person. And I don't know, like there's a... You know, when, when we were in school, there was definitely like a, a priority put on group projects and collaborating well with others, where I think a lot of these tech jobs have allowed people to work in their si own silos a little bit and less collaboratively. And I don't necessarily think that's good. I think you are awesome. And I think you are a wonderful representation of the best of your generation. And so we're so happy you're here today. Milan, thank you so much for joining us here on Motivational Mondays. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for having me, Corey. Um, it was such a pleasure having this conversation.